Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Don't let this rain get you down. It's time to praise the Lord. We're in church with God's people. Amen. It is good to see you today. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. <laughs> Have a mind of its own, doesn't it? <laughs> We've been talking about spiritual warfare and sermon series entitled Battle Ready, which focuses specifically in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, where Paul is wrapping up that powerful letter to the Ephesian church. And uh, this whole thing is, uh, you know, you, you can't just take this part of Ephesians, just kind of pluck it out because we'll see as, as I talk about today, so much related to other things that are mentioned in the letter that, that build on this as he comes to this part in verse 10 when he says, finally. So in other words, you know, of all the instruction he's been given and he's been talking to them about how they're going to live their life. But before he even gets to that, he talks about who they are in Christ. And I think one thing that Christians suffer from today so much is who we are in Christ. And therefore, people live well below the standard of what God has for them because they don't even realize what God has done for them. So uh, help us to understand, Lord, all that you have accomplished for us. What a crazy uh, couple of weeks this has been from everything from the Florida shootings to the loss of Billy Graham. I thought singing How Great the Art this morning is a great tribute to him. I think most every crusade they did had How Great Thou Art and Just As I Am. Those two hymns. The Wednesday night we did Just As I Am as a tribute, but uh, what a powerful man of God, what a great ambassador for Christ. In some circles, extremely controversial simply because he stood on the Word of God. But that's worth ha having controversy over, amen? I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And what a great influence, uh, and what a great ambassador for Christ, amen? amen? Someone has such a powerful stand and a powerful testimony and not only impacted so many people for Christ, but impacted so many evangelists and pastors for the Lord and for the gospel as well to stand true. So uh, we'll see you soon, Brother Billy. Amen? And uh, probably sooner than what most of us think. So let's get to our message this morning because this is extremely important. I know that every day we all face tremendous conflicts. Uh, many times we don't realize, as Paul has mentioned in this letter, that there are spiritual conflicts. And we need to realize that. I think it helps us to understand that there's more than goes on than what meets the eye. There's a lot of things we deal with, and we think, we think mostly it's in the physical sense of what we can touch, taste, see, feel. But it goes beyond that, and Paul mentions principalities and powers. In fact, let's look at this passage of Scripture this morning. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the powers and against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist an evil day and have done everything to, to stand firm. Verse 14 wraps it up. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which we will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows or missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, each week, if we've talked about this suiting up and being battle ready, I want to always bring you back to this important point. According to Romans 13, when Paul writes to the church there, really all this is Jesus. We're putting off the old man and we're putting on the new man in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6 breaks down literally what that, that means to us in a very uh, applicable way, that I can apply it this way in my life, to my mind, to my heart, to my, to, to, to my inner being, to, to my feet, to my walk. Every part of my life is covered in Jesus. We put off the old man. We make no provision for the flesh. It goes on to say to fulfill the desires of it. But we're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And every part of this points to the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is the gospel, amen, in, in, in personified. He is our righteousness, according to what Romans 5 tells us. That when we get saved, we receive the gift of righteousness. He, he is, you know, uh, every part of, of every aspect of this, from the, from the belt to the shield of faith to the helmet of salvation to the, to the sword of the Spirit. We're going to deal with the last three pieces of the armor. Last couple of weeks, we've talked about the belt having girded our loins with truth. And what that means, that we're going to live a life of truth before the Lord. We're going to live a life of truth with others. And most importantly, we're going to have to be honest with ourselves. We can't, we can't deceive ourselves. Uh, one of the tragic things about so many people today is they live in a world of self-deception. They willingly deceive themselves about where they are and what they are doing and what their life really means. 
So we're going to be honest and we're going to walk in truth and we're going to, we're going to also put on the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Remember we said the breastplate is the heart protector and how important it is to guard our hearts for out of it are the issues of our life. And we talked about having our shoes, the, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and what that means in our life of, of being ready, having a firm foundation and always being ready to share the gospel with anybody else, but also standing on the power of the gospel in our life and believing in the power of God's word. Today, we'll I'll mention the rest of this wardrobe, and then next week I want to talk about a real application of this and the standing firm and therefore standing firm again and this, all this armor and how it all comes together in prayer as well. So I think that sometimes that part is left off when we talk about spiritual warfare because once we get all dressed up, we're, we're supposed to fight, all right, not run. Amen? So as we've talked about this and seeing that all this is really our position in the Christ, These next three things help us continue winning in the spiritual battle against the forces of wickedness in high places. He talks about taking up the shield of faith. Now, on the picture, we have a Roman soldier with a big round shield, but uh, most likely this was a different kind of shield that the Romans used specifically, and it was a large shield, a minimum of four feet tall. I mean, so it protected a great portion of your body. These were shields that were used specifically against the battle of, of fiery missiles, of, of the arrows that would come flying through the air. These Roman soldiers would stand side by side and perform a wall with these, with, with these shields. They were like a big door you're behind it. And then also that the one, they'd pull up another Roman soldier behind him, and they would put the shield over their heads, protecting the one in front and the one in back. So you had this barrier of protection. So it was a large shield which covered pretty much the whole person. Now, you don't have to reach for this at all. When you go through Scripture, and especially the Old Testament, you see over and over again the repetition of a shield and how God is a shield to those who love him, how he preserves us and protects us, and he's a shield around about us. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6, it tells us he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He basically is our protection. But he says here what we're doing, we're taking up the shield of faith. Now, biblical faith, in case you don't understand biblical faith, it is simply believing what God has said and acting on it. Now, I know there's a lot of teaching on the, on the airways and books that have been written that really are misrepresenting this whole idea of what biblical faith is. We have what we call the faith teachers and the faith preachers, and they present an ideology and an incorrect view of Scripture, I believe, uh, and doctrine that says faith is a force. You know, it's kind of like... You're going to be a Jedi warrior and let the force be with you, I guess. I'm not sure. But you you enact the force of God and that that faith goes forward like this forth and you speak this faith by by spoken words and the forces are created. And they use illustrations incorrectly, of course, that God created everything by the word of his mouth. And so that God used faith to create the world. And on and on it goes. Faith is not a force, folks, all right? Don't be deceived. It's not some mystical thing which you kind of hopefully can lay hold of if you're fortunate enough you know, or you hope to get enough. Uh, it's, it's not so much your lack of faith. The Bible tells us God's given every man a measure of faith, all right? You have what you need. But what faith really boils down to, well, if Romans 10 puts it this way, that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God through the word of God. In other words, our faith is based upon what God has said. All right, I choose to believe what God has said. So biblical faith is, uh, the simplest definition is following what the Lord has told us. Believing. The reason I follow is because I believe. The reason I commit is because I believe. The reason I live is because I believe. And I believe what God has said. So it's not not something that you've got to learn how to formulate in your mind and speak just correctly. It's a matter of obedience to the truth. The old hymn said, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. That's what it really comes down to. So don't don't be deceived that there's something mystical or unique about this. And it's hard to grasp because it's not. Faith is where you and I lay hold of the resources that God has given us, which is his word. It's belief in his word, which gives us access to his power and his authority in our life. So that when Satan comes against us, we're standing firm in what we know to be the truth of God's word. We're living it out and we're holding it up. Remember, what is Satan's weapon against us? It's lies. It's accusations, according to scripture. The temptations where he tries to draw us away, even with our own appetites and desires to do that, which God tells us not to do. So he's saying, how do you, how do you quench those things, those accusations? How do you deal with the lies when they come? You're not good enough. It's not going to work out. There's no way. God didn't say that. All those other things that come in. He says, here we meet him head on with the word of God. We hold up our shield of faith. 
We believe what God has said to us. Now, if you follow the Ephesian letter, in the beginning, Paul's telling them they've come to a relationship with God through faith. Remember, even in Ephesians 2, it says we're not saved by works, but we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. God has given us a word. We have chose to believe that word. I know that I'm a Christian because of what the Bible says. I trusted what God said. The Bible made it clear that God loved me. The Bible makes it clear that I'm a sinner separated from God by my sin. I believe that. The Bible made it clear that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin on the cross. I believe that. I accept it and believe that word of God. The Bible said, Jesus, if any man will come after me, let him follow me. I chose to follow Christ. God did some things on my behalf at that point. Not because I'm such a good guy. He already made it clear as a sinner. All right. He already made it clear there's no righteous work that I could do on my own to qualify me for heaven. So he gives me his gift of life, his gift of salvation, his gift of righteousness. He does that as I choose to believe what he said. Satan still loves to come, uses the same old thing he did in the garden with, when Eve, when he says to Eve, uh, hath God said, did God really say that? Did, you know, he still does the same thing. Or stuff like this, he'll whisper in your ear, well, that's not what God really meant. <laughs> or things have changed. And time, so he comes with all kinds of lies, mistruth, accusations are one of his favorite ways to work, and he continues to bombard our minds. So Paul tells us we have this relationship. We've come to know God through faith. And now he tends to use it in a little different way. We're now in our faith by lifting up the shield of faith. We are laying hold of the promises of God. We're taking the word of God and we're choosing to believe it in the action of the warfare that we may be going through, the battle that we may be struggling in, the temptation we may be being tried in. We just take the word of God and we say, here's what God says about that. Here's what the truth of the matter is. Faith is where we choose to believe. So simply put, to take the shield of faith is to appropriate and accept and believe the promises of God that he made to us on our behalf. And we're confident, we're trusting that he's going to protect us in the midst of the battle. We're holding that up as our shield. God is faithful. God's going to trust, God's going to protect me because I am resting and I'm believing and I'm hiding behind the shield of his word. Now, The thing about those shields were they were designed specifically to stop flaming arrows. They were pretty much made of wood, covered perhaps with bits of metal, covered with with leather ultimately completely, and then drenched before battle and soaked in water. So that when the pitch that was on the arrows that made them flame while flying would hit the shield, they would quench those flaming swords. It's interesting to know that, hey, your faith is important, and the way you keep your faith in action is stay in the Word of God. You drench that shield with water. And the water is the water of God's word. So we're staying true to God's word. If you want a great faith, you have to be in a great book. This is the word of God. Your faith will not grow. Your faith will not increase if you're not in the word of God. You've got to have a commitment to the truth of God's word. The Bible has been shelved for so many Christians. So little time is given to it. So little commitment is given to it. And they're so easily defeated in the midst of their conflicts because their faith is so weak. If you want to grow strong in your faith, you grow strong in the word of God. You've got to become confident in the word of God. But how can you be confident when you don't even know what it says or you're not aware The key to victory is obviously getting down the simple fact of me being more in love with God, more in love with his word, spending more time with him. We talk about Christianity and intimacy with God a lot in the culture we live in. God loves us. God wants us to love him. It's all about fellowship. It's all about intimacy. Listen carefully to me. There can be no intimacy if you don't know the word of God and you're not in the word of God. And there can be no intimacy with God if there's no time with God. And there can be no intimacy with God if there's no time spent in prayer with God. And I think a lot of people are running out with a shield of faith that's about this big. (laughs) It's good in the beginning days, but the more you go on with God, this salt begins to increase against your life. And so you, you need to be grounded in the word of God. You need to, the Bible says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. You've got to, if there's not been it, you've got to start. You've got to get committed to the Word of God in your life and get back to the basics of reading the Word daily and committing yourself to knowing what God's Word is saying to you. And in so doing, when the enemy comes in with a wide range of attacks, he will come in and he'll light his arrows and he will begin to fire them at you. 
And all too many Christians just don't have much of a shield that they're taking place by and, and they're becoming exposed to everything the devil throws at them. Remember that one place where it says we're, we're, we're about Satan's devices in the scripture, Satan's wiles or Satan's schemes. Your translation may read Satan's methods. In other words, Satan is methodical. We've talked about this. He is strategic. So what do we have to do? The only way to fight him is be strategic with our life. And one of the most strategic things you can do in your life, in your Christian walk, and in your Christian warfare, is become so familiar with the Word of God. So that when lies come, you recognize that it is a lie. When doubts come, you recognize that it is a lie. When fears come, you recognize that it is a lie. And every kind of thing Satan will throw at you, he will throw at you. He will tempt you. He will tempt me with the most ungodly things, most ungodly behavior. And and we will give in to that or we will not. He will tell you that no matter what you do, you're never going to succeed as a believer. Or it's never going to work out. Or God doesn't really care about you. Or God's not committed. On and on, lie after lie. And all too often, we just respond to the arrow. You can usually tell when the arrows get through. There's followed by a loud loud ouch. (laughs) Satan gets through to me, I usually respond some way. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of my big deals is impatience. You'll never guess that, would you? I can be real impatient. I'm learning, all right, in Christ, patience. And then I have my little helper that God sent me. Say, the Holy Spirit, yes, but my other little helper, my wife, <laughs> who's always there to remind me, you don't know what they're going through, Pastor Joe. Joe, you just need to be patient with them. Yes, they may be putting along two miles an hour in the 70 mile an hour zone, but you don't know what they're going through today. She's the most merciful person, and sometimes I call her just blindly ignorant. (laughs) (laughs) But she has that gift of mercy. And then God, in his wonderful sense of humor, had her marry me because I needed lots of mercy. But the other day, just to give an illustration of this, you know, I'm sitting in line. You know, and, and I don't know about you, one of the things that really gets me going is when, you know, when, when people just do stupid stuff or they're just ignorant. You know, there's a difference between being ignorant and stupid. Ignorant is when you, when you, you know to do something you don't do it, you're just ignorant, you just ignore it, right? Stupid is when you do it anyway, you're stupid, all right? You, you don't know or you're just stupid. And those are two things that sometimes just cause me to be a little irritated about stuff, all right? Not so much with everyone, but people who should know what they're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm running around, I'm trying to catch up on some of the sunshine we had this weekend. So I'm pruning trees in my yard. And I have about a dozen and a half, you know, crepe myrtles. They all got to be trimmed. And, you know, and now they got so big, a pair of pruning shears. Well, you know, I'm, getting these pruning shears. I'm working them from every way, longer ones. Still, so I'm having to go get a saw and back and forth getting stuff and then stacking it all up and big burn pile and all that stuff. And so I'm just wore out. So I said, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get something to eat. So I'm, while I'm between... The hardware store and the auto store, there, there's a Burger King in Magnolia. I pull in the Burger King, and I'm hungry, and I just want to get something to eat. And I'm frustrated, and I'm tired, and I'm hurting. Yes, sir, can I take your order? Yes, sir, I'd like that number one, no onions, please, and uh, just a medium drink. Dr. Pepper's fine. Okay, can I take your order? <laughs> yes, sir, I'd like that number one, no onions, please, uh, a medium-sized drink, a Dr. Pepper, please. Okay, that was a what? Uh, and I can hear Kathy. She's not with me in the car, but I can hear. <laughs> Job, just be okay. It's going to be okay. He's probably got five people talking to him at one time. I said, that'll be a number one. A medium. No onions on that burger, please. And uh, a Dr. Pepper, Medium. And what was that last part, sir? I hear it again, Joe. You don't know what's going through. He's probably got five people talking to me. He said, sir, I'm sorry. He said, I know. He said, I, I, I have five people talking to me at one time. <laughs> so Kathy's right again, you know. <laughs> so I just kind of laughed at this point. Just, you know, sometimes you see the setup, you know, and say he's just trying to get on your skin with little stuff. And it bother you all with little stuff. Can't get you on a big one. He'll just bug you to death with little ones. So I just said, oh, I, I, I said, I understand your pain, sir. I understand your pain. And just laughed it off and pulled up to the window. And the manager came up to the window and says, that was funny. I said, I'm glad you thought so. She said, I was listening to you on the headset and I was listening to the whole thing. And I thought, she said, your response was just priceless. You know, I feel your pain. She said, that's the best thing all day. Your lunch is free today. So <laughs> I got to think, how many free lunches could I have had in my life by now if I'd just been patient? <laughs> 
How many things do we pass up just because we let a fiery dart get through? Amen. Because we just don't hold the truth. We just don't believe a promise. We just don't hold on to God. But they come in other ways. That's just those simple things. We know the accusation comes. And we know sometimes the massive assaults of temptation. And, and, and it just doesn't stop there. Satan can use other things. I mean, he uses, he can use situations with false doctrine. The Bible warns a lot about Satan coming in with lying doctrines and things that just aren't true. We have to protect ourselves for that. How do we know the truth from error? We learn the truth from the Word of God. We have to believe, you know, what the Bible says. That's everything is based upon Scripture. So Paul's sense here is that there's extreme danger in your spiritual life, and you need to be prepared with the shield of faith. The forces you're fighting against are wicked forces. They're evil forces. They're in high places. But you can be confident that your faith in God, you're greater still in Christ. Now, the second thing he goes on to in this part of our message is the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. In fact, as you look at this, the helmet is salvation itself. I mean, that's what, that's what we're urged to, to take hold of and to engage in the spiritual battle that we're in. You remember you're a child of God, ultimately. You embrace the fact that you cover your brain, your head, this protection. The helmet would usually be very thin metal and would have earpieces that would come down and protect the cheeks and even down to the lower part of the neck. It was there to protect that vital part of your, your body, your brain, where you function so you don't lose control. You should know by now, if you've been in this battle very long at all as a Christian, that the battleground is not so much external, it's internal. It goes on here in your head. The thoughts come, the lies come, the accusation come, the doubts come, the fears come, the disappointments, the discouragement. It all takes place up here where Satan just loves to whisper his lies. Now, in this letter, we said, Paul starts up in the early part of Ephesians by telling them who they are in Christ, that they have experienced salvation by faith. And what that means to them is now that God has placed them, not only has he come into their lives, we have come into his life, all right? We are in Christ now. And he tells them that we're seated now in heavenly places. Now, catch what he says there in Ephesians 1 and 2 as he's talking about our identity. He says, we're far above those principalities and powers. We're doing battle with them. But in authority, in dominion, in might, and in power, we rank above that because we're in Christ. Satan is the God of this world. That's a little g. God is a big G of this world. Jesus is the Lord of all things. In other words, as John wrote it, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We don't cower. We don't back up. We don't have to run. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be intimidated by what Satan might throw at my life or he might throw at your life. Because we are in Christ. Your authority is bigger and greater and more powerful than the authority that he has. So this issue of salvation, one it's this present aspect of salvation. This is what he's stressing. That God has rescued you from death, from wrath, from bondage. He's brought you into his kingdom, which is the kingdom of light. That is the dominion we live in. That's the kingdom that we rule in. This place now is a place of power. You and I can experience the authority of God in our life. It doesn't have a thing to do with how I feel. I don't feel power. If you want to feel some power, stick your finger in the light socket. You'll feel something. But that's not what this is about. It's not about who could feel the most or feel the most authority. It's about fact. And the fact is that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have what you need. You need to be assured of that, that in your salvation, God's given you what you need. You say, I don't know if I can face this. You can face it. I don't know if I can deal with it. You can deal with it. And this helmet you have assures you of that. It's the helmet of salvation. You've experienced a new life. You're a new person. Somebody say amen. I don't know what you, are you sleeping through the rain? What's up here? <laughs> this, is, this is life transforming. If you can just get down to this. I don't have to do what Satan tells me to do. I don't have to do what my flesh may feel led to do. I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to. In case you didn't get it, I don't have to. Let me put it this way. Maybe it'll help. You don't have to. <laughs> Neither do you. Because of who you are in Christ. But what God has done by placing you in his kingdom. And it is a place of authority. It's a place of God's great power. Now, the helmet protects, obviously, said, one of the most critical parts of your body. Your mind. That's where the battle's lost. It's where it's raged or where it's won will be right here what's going on in your mind. 
And one of the most important things you need to get down in your mind is you belong to God. You're a child of God. You've been saved. You've been set free. You've been delivered. You know the king. You're in good standing with the king. Because Satan's onslaught will come right here. So that needs to be assured. In fact, I would probably say the first error where Satan struck me as a young believer, new in the Lord, probably first and foremost, and maybe you can feel the same way, those early days of my salvation was, uh, are you really saved? Are you really a Christian? Getting you to doubt it, you know? And tragically, too many Christians stay there. They just lost that battle right off the bat because they go through a little exercise. Well, I, th- I like to think I'm, I walk the aisle. Well, there's no verse that says you walk the aisle and it gets you saved, so I'm in trouble there. Well, I was baptized. Well, there's no verse that says baptism will save you, so I'm sunk there. Well, I read my Bible every day. I couldn't find that verse either that says I, I, because I, I'm saved by reading my Bible every day. So what do I have to stand on? I have to stand on God's Word. Here in my head, it comes to an assurance that I believe I am a child of God because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I've been changed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I get that solid and set and secure in my mind. My salvation is settled. There's an absolute assurance that I belong to God. And in that assurance comes the fact that I'm equipped, I'm ready, I'm prepared. Doesn't matter what comes down the pike, I'm ready to meet it because of who I am in Christ. I have this helmet of salvation that provides the protection that I need. Paul talks about this and other things when he talks about it in your mind. He says, you need to pull down every thought and bring every thought into captivity. You know, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, what does that mean? That means that Satan will come to you, speak to your mind, and tell you things that are contrary to what God says. Thus, it's called a lie. Now, you can entertain those things, and you can believe those things, and you can worry about those things. You can say, I don't want to think those things. I don't want to think those things. But that's not going to take care of it. Literally, says, you have to take those things captive. You have to say, I, that's a lie. I'm taking it captive. And it says, I bring it to Christ. I said, well, Brother Joe, I've got some stuff going on in my mind I don't think Christ wants to see. <laughs> Listen, God knows everything going on in your life, whether you know that or not. <laughs> and he wants to see it recognized by you as under the blood now. Recognized by you as forgiven. Recognized by you as repented of. So I bring it to the Lord's eye. Thank you that I'm, I'm in Christ now. And I don't have to think these things. In fact, there's this principle of replacement that kind of goes like this. So I'm not going to think about the things that are impure, right? Well, how do you do that? You think about the things that are pure. Well, I don't want to think about the things that are just, you know, wicked and unjust. So what am I going to do? I'm going to think about the things that are just. I don't want to think about those things that I know are just a bad report from the devil. He's trying to tell me a lie about some words. Hey, then what am I going to do? I'm going to think about the things that are of a good report. Listen to the way Paul put it in Philippians 4 when he says, listen, whatsoever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of a good report, think on these things. That's donning the helmet of salvation. That's where my thought life is going to go. I'm going to pull down the stronghold. So the helmet assures my position in Christ Jesus, but to be really wearing it, I really believe my mind is set on things above and not on things below. That I'm not going to be carnally minded, I'm going to be spiritually minded. The last element of this whole armor, he says, and taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So I'm, I'm withstanding now with my shield the fiery darts of the, of the enemy. And I've got my helmet, my assurance that I belong to God and that he's with me and that I'm in him. I'm ready to stand against the powers of darkness, but I don't just stand there. I've been given an offensive weapon. The only one that's mentioned is this offensive weapon. And it's, it's a term used here in the, in the Greek language. There's different words for swords. This is a word which meant a shorter combat, combat sword. It, it was maybe 18 inches long. It, it's not like you see in, in some of the pictures like this, four or five feet long sword, where you're kind of standing with the enemy at a distance and, you know, dingling swords back at each other. This is get up close and dirty. This is, this is combat hand to hand. This is a sharp sword. This is, this is for gigging them. All right? This is for sticking. All right? This is for bringing some damage to the enemy. He says, you, you're going to have to stand against the force of hell. And if you want to do some damage or you want to gain some ground, here's the way you're going to have to do it. It's one thing to take care of the onslaught and be 
armored up and suited up for the battle. And you have all these things that are being a, working in a protective manner for you. But there is now a moment where you have to step forward and you have to move in the opposition. You have to move not just from a defensive point, but from an offensive point where you're taking up the, the sword. He said, and what is it? It is the word of God. And by the way, it's the right kind of sword. Hebrews tells us it is sharper, it's living, it's active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. This is the Word of God. It goes beyond surface to deep, deep, all right? It shows the difference between right and wrong, between what is something that's spiritual or just something that's maybe soulless, which means mental or emotional or just physical, to what is really the truth and what is based on spiritual fact. It gets down to discern, helping you discern your motives and your intents and your desires. You embrace this sword. You take up the sword. You hold the sword. It's identified here as the Word of God. Now, this word is used by Paul several places in Ephesians. In fact, when he uses the word in English, we see in Ephesians, Word of God, Word of God, Word of God, mentioned multiple times. In fact, through all of Paul's letters, he talks about the Word of God. There is this unique terminology in Scripture. Sometimes the Word of God is translated with the word logos to the English word word. Sometimes it's the word rhema that's translated to the English terminology of word. This word here, when he says we take up the sword, which is the Word of God, it's not necessarily, in fact, it is not logos. It is the word he uses here for rhema. They're interchangeable in a lot of ways, but the word rhema has to do with something that has made, been made known and revealed and confessed, embraced, and spoken word of God. It says you take up the spoken word of God. In other words, you speak the word of God. That which God is speaking to your heart, you speak up. This latter term, rhema, emphasizes something that is declared, something that is said in confession. This is the way we live our lives and live in our, in our walk with God. Is that we're not only believing what is written to us and what's been shared with us. And Jesus, he's that living Logos. But now we're taking what has impacted my life. Something God has spoken to me. And now I'm speaking that word out. When I got saved, God took the written Logos word of God. And he took the gospel. And one day it came with lights on. In other words, I understood it. I got it. All right? Before, in one ear, out the other ear, or reject, I didn't want to hear about it. Self was in the way, sin was in the way, I want to live for myself. But God got me to a place in my life, finally of desperation and brokenness. So when the gospel came through at that time, it came through loud and clear, as I say, with lights on. I saw the truth of it. You know what the Bible says? That Satan has blinded the mind of unbelievers, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Christ Jesus. So we're not warning. But there's, then there's that time, well, you know what it's like to be just in your private Bible study and God speak a word to you, like the lights come on. Is that words for me? Am I, is that just me? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Right? This means uh-huh. Okay. When God just says that, means, oh, that's, that's, that was for me. That's what I needed here. The lights came on. It's important when the lights come on that we speak what God has shown to us and that we say what God has shown to us and that we, we're, we're not afraid to confess. This is, I mean, put this the simplicity together here. The moment I, I really, when the lights came on, I realized, I, you know, you're a sinner. You need to get right with God. Your life is messed up. You're going to continue to mess your life up. You need to get right with God. Now that going to hell, you deserve to go to hell. All right? Facts all came together. And I chose Jesus in that moment, and I repented of myself and my sin. All right? And I gave my heart and my life to Christ. You know what followed that? I believed the Word of God, and I stood on the Word of God. And the Bible says, you believe in your heart, and you confess with your mouth. Well, that's one thing I, Billy Graham takes, has taken a lot of heat for in this, this more current generation of the church today because many churches won't give invitations, right? Because, you know, they're not seeker sensitive. People are a little, you know, hey, one of the big issues in your life, folks, get over it, is your pride, all right? And Graham would offer those mass crusade invitations where thousands of people would come forward. And what were they doing? They were believing in their heart and they were going to confess their salvation to someone at the front. I've given my life to Christ. I've made a decision for Christ. And someone would greet them and meet them and pray with them and counsel them. And, you know, we still give invitations at Believer's Fellowship. As long as I'm pastoring here, we're going to do that, all right? We're going to do because I believe that's a biblical principle of once we hear and receive, then we confess. That's why we have testimony services sometimes, especially in our retreats and things where God's done a work in you. It's important for you to speak that word to other people. Why? Because you need to hear it. The devil needs to hear it, all right? And it needs to be confirmed in your own heart and life. It's kind of like you need to nail it down. And speaking it 
Well, all of a sudden, that's a whole new world of accountability goes right there. Amen? I'm now accountable for what I've said. If I said it out loud, hey, then I, I want to be more cautious and more careful to keep what God has spoken to me and what I have spoken to others. It's a powerful thing when we speak the Word. The Bible says, let us hold fast our confession. I think this is what he's talking about. When we're in battle, we need to hold fast our confession. We need to take up the Word of God, and we need to swing it. You say, why is it important to speak it? First of all, let me tell you this. The devil's not omniscient. The devil doesn't know what you're thinking. You may be speaking the Word of God all day long in your heart and your mind, but you can be sure the devil doesn't hear it. It's been a lie, perhaps, that you believed that thought, you thought Satan could read your mind. He can't. So I think it's important that I tell him what's on my mind. He's been trying to put stuff on my mind. He can do that. He can interject thoughts into my mind. That's where the battle takes place. And it's good for me to meet those thoughts with righteous thoughts, pure, noble, just, those thoughts. But it's another thing for me to stand and say, this is what God's word says. Look at Jesus, 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. And he meets the devil head on each one of them. And he says this, it is written. He spoke it. Well, Brother Joe, I can't see the devil. I, you know, it's all right. He can see you. I don't, I, 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 I don't know about that speaking out. Well, here's the good part about it. Most people won't think you're too crazy. They're always on their cell phone with a headset. So it looks like they're talking to themselves all the time anyway. But the thing about it, I find that Satan usually hits me in these big times and powerful times when I'm alone. Anybody ever discovered that but me? <laughs> or at night, late. And so the best thing you can do in those moments is speak it. Satan, it is written. Now, here's the thing about it. You say, Brother Joe, I've got an area of my life that I've just been defeated on. And I, I keep coming back. I, I'll be free for a day or two, a week, a month, whatever. But I just cycle right back into it. How about it's time to get on your armor and take up your sword this time, the next time the temptation comes. And the sword is the word of God. And when the word of God speaks to your heart, you speak that to the devil. Now, here's what will help you in that. Whatever that area might be, maybe it's your mouth, maybe it's some desire, maybe it's lust, or whatever it is. Why don't you commit to memory five or six verses that deal with that very specific thing which you've been fighting with and losing in. Arm yourself strategically. He's very strategic in his battle against you. Amen. We're not aware, we need to be aware of Satan's schemes, but we need to have our own devices and our own schemes. And the scheme and the devices is this, it's the Word of God. So that when Satan comes and he hits you in some specific area, then you have a proper and appropriate response in that moment. It is written and stick him. Stick him. Say it. Confess it. Now, the thing about it, God knows my thoughts, praise the Lord. And I can pray in private in my heart, in my mind, and God hears everything I'm saying. Hey, but even in, in, in times of, of, of prayer, I'll, I'll verbally speak to the Lord out loud because my ears need to hear it sometimes. But you need to realize, you know, it's all these occultic practices and all these occultic claims about how Satan can read minds or how that he knows the future or these sorcerers and tarot card readers. And all things. They, they don't know nothing. All right? You can believe it if you want, pay your money if you want to do it. They don't know anything. They're dumb as dirt, okay? They, and, and in fact, they just lied to you. You say, well, I, th something happened. Hey, anybody can tell you something. And it's so generic. Oh, that's what that was. I read it in the fortune cookie. <laughs> Guy in the fortune cookie factory doesn't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow. He's just printing that stuff out, cutting it up fast, he can't stick any cookies. All right? There's, no, there's nothing sovereign about that. He doesn't know. But God knows. And God knows you're eternally secure. And God knows you're eternally His. And God knows that everything's been done that needs to be done for you to be victorious and successful. You need to get it in your heart and your mind. And you need to take it up as a sword and use it against the enemy. And say what God has said to you. Speak the word of God. Look at the scriptures. You'll see this carries throughout the whole thing. God's given me a shield because the arrows are coming. And they'll come many times. I was reading and studying this, and I saw where one uh, Greek historian was talking about this Roman soldier and that they were recounting the battle. And he says when he came out of battle, and he had one of those big shields. He said there were, he counted over 225 arrows in his shield. Well, do you get that at every day, man? <laughs> I think we get that many a day. It can come at us. 
But we have a shield. Our faith in Jesus Christ is based upon our great God, not my great faith. But I can increase my understanding of God's word. I believe I increase my ability to believe God and trust God even more because I'm saturating my heart and my life with the word of God. I place on the helmet of salvation where my assurance is in God and not in myself. And I protect my mind and I rehearse in my mind. Yes, as the enemy comes, I place the proper thoughts. I pull down the lies and the strongholds and I place the right ones of thought. But then I take up the shield and I move into action with it and I speak. It is written. I have victory. I'm an overcomer in Christ. In this world, I have tribulation, but I'm of good cheer because Christ has overcome the world. Just approach this world. Yes, it's a physical world. Yes, it's, we touch, we taste, we feel real things. Happen. But I'm not talking about imaginary Aesop's fables here. I'm talking about the Word of God, which is much more enduring and which is much more real or realer than this world is. Because the Bible says the Word of God will endure forever. This world will not. So when you stand upon God and you stand upon his word and you place your faith in him and you speak his word to the enemy assaulting your life, you can walk in victory in your life. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't know. We all deal with different things. We all have different temptations. and We all have different things that come against us. What problem for you might not be a problem for me. But I guarantee you, I got a problem in the area. <laughs> Don't, don't get into that little deal where you feel like, I'm the only one going through this. That's just another lie. The Bible says, brethren, the same trials and temptations are going out to all your brethren in the world. We all face those trials. And we all face the temptations. And we all face crisis. And we all face difficult, horrible times in our life. We all face death. But I want you to know God's word is faithful to you. You believe God. I had one friend of mine, he told me, he says, you know, I'm so depressed. He said, you know, I, just, I give in to that depression in my life. And he said, I think maybe just giving into it, I'll just, the devil will leave me alone. He said, then it just gets worse. He said, I've learned now to start taking a stand against it at its beginning stages, that I can be victorious. And I don't have to live my life in despair because God is the God of hope. And you, he took those verses and he applies them to his life about hope. God says, I have a, a purpose, an expectation. I have a future for you. Or are you going to believe the other? We stress out. We freak out. We worry. We give in to some of the silliest things and some of the biggest things. But God is sufficient, as Paul the Apostle said, for all these things. We need to find him in the midst of what we're going through. And especially when we're in this war zone, and we are every day, in our families, over our children, in our jobs, in the culture we live in, and our own flesh opposes us many times. But we're going to suit up, and we're going to stand, and we're going to be what God's called us to be, and we're going to most and foremost embrace his word, read his word, memorize his word, place his word in our life, realize the importance of God's word in our life, and we're going to walk in victory in Jesus Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed? It could be.